Oh, well, praise the Lord. Let's stand as we begin worship this morning. Majesty, and we worship his majesty this morning. I want to hear everybody singing this morning. Sing it out. Majesty. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. You ready? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Good to see your smiling faces. Um, if you are visiting, look to the corner, the end of your pew, and there's a little sheet, and just fill that out, and put it in the offering plate when it comes your way, so we can have a record of your visit, or we can have you just stand and embarrass you now. <laughs> just fill out the paper. That's fine. Just do that. All right, um, let's grab our bulletins. Let's look through the bulletin today. Oh, if you open it up, you'll have a little sheet fall out. This is your reservation form for Wednesday night supper. Now, it says down here September 17th. That is wrong. It is August, buddy. You don't have to wait another two months. It is August 17th. Just a couple of weeks. We will begin back our Wednesday night suppers at 530, and we will um, be testing out the chicken casserole recipe. It is a good recipe. You will want to be a part of that. All right, so fill that out, put it in the offering plate, and just take note that there's been some um, increase in prices that's just going around, so we thought, hey, let's be a part of it, too. Um, all right. Um, on August 8th, which is a Monday, uh, the teachers and staff, faculty from Pleasant Valley will be coming here to eat lunch. We always do a teacher luncheon for them, 
and they mainly come for the desserts. So uh, that would be your job. Get some desserts made for um, that Monday morning. You've got a couple of days to prepare, um, a little, a, b a bunch of couple of days. So really think about that chocolate cake, those brownies, coconut cake, lemon, something with lemon, strawberry something. Shirley, what are you thinking? Coconut? Okay. Just bring it on on August 8th. All right, now I know you've been collecting things for the Creative Arts Camp that's coming up in August. Thank you. Just hand that to me. You know you're supposed to be collecting your trash and just handing it over to me, and I go through it. And I'm really excited for a lot of the things that y'all have brought and what these kids are going to make out of it. I can't wait. It's going to be great. But if you are going to be volunteering and you want to help, I want to meet with you right after the service next Sunday. So be prepared for that. It will be short. I will get you to lunch. Just know that next Sunday. All right, and here's a list of school supplies if you want to help. These are some things that we end up needing all year long. A binder breaks, a backpack tears up, crayons break too. So it would just be great to have a, just a refill stack of this, all these items. So if you want to help and collect that stuff, that would be great for our school kids. Um, and one last thing, youth. You're from 7th to 8th grade, 7th, 8th, not 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Sorry, that's the cutoff. We're going to go eat ice cream. Everybody else has to stay home. I'm sorry. No, but if you are a youth, 5 o'clock, meet here, and then we will go eat ice cream afterwards. All right? Now, I know you have been waiting to show off your teeth, but I want you to do that today. To someone across the aisle, I know it, it's challenging. You're going to have to really focus on someone. Now, I want you to try harder and even wave and get their attention, all right? Can you do it? Ready? Go. Well, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, if I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Ryan, and I have the privilege of being the pastor of this place, First Baptist Church of Williams. Um, I'll say a, a little bit more later on in the service, but as we begin our time of worship, I wanted to just lead us in a time of prayer. So if you would, please bow your heads with me and let us go to the Lord now in prayer. Our Father and our God, we come before you today humbled. God, we come trembling before you because you are a God of glory and wonder. And Father, you have invited us to your throne room. You have invited us into your presence, and indeed, you have come now to meet us. Father, as we, uh, as we stand before you uh, as, as a the norm in the Bible, we want to, we are aware of our sinfulness, and we want to begin, Father, uh, not in fear, but God, we confess our sins. Your word promises in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, we confess that this week we have not loved you with all of our heart, with all of our mind with all of our soul or with all of our strength. We confess that we have not loved our neighbor as ourself. There are things that we ought to have done that we did not do, and there are things that we did not do that we ought to have done or that we did. And so, Father, we uh, confess our sins, again, knowing that we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We stand before you not groveling, uh, not weak, but rather strong because you have raised us up. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to our station to become a human, to live a perfect life, to die upon the cross for our sins and to raise again on the third day. And that's why we meet this Sunday. And so, Father, now that he has ascended to your right hand and has been glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, we worship him today. And so, Father, we ask that you would meet with us. And indeed, you promised that you would as we raise our voices in song, as we hear from your word read and proclaimed, as we give of our tithes and our offerings later in the worship service, and as we pray these prayers even, Father, we pray that you would meet us. God, would you transform us 
to become more like your son, Jesus Christ. Send your spirit to this place. God, we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Are y'all ready? What do I look like I'm ready to do? Oh. Are you really ready? You sure? All right, well, so let's talk a little bit. So when we go to school, how many of you have how many of you have gone and got your like supplies for school? You know, you get excited about that. I remember I would that was one of my favorite things to do is get ready to go to school and my mom would take me, we'd go get my supplies, and I'd sometimes get a new outfit. And I learned real quick. Hmm, particular stores that I might could get more than one outfit because they didn't cost as much as what the other stuff cost, right? So I learned that real quick. That was a lot of fun. So when we go to school, y'all have a back, what's this? Backpack, okay? So we take all our stuff in it. And I brought different things because at different grade levels, you have different things. So a lot of these are Levi, so I got to give them back to him. <laughs> so y'all have a pencil bag? And then that pencil bag, what do you usually have in that pencil bag? Markers. We even have a pencil sharpener, crayons, pencils, scissors, glue, right? What's this? Paper. Do you use that? Yes. We use that. <laughs> How many have used this? What's this? Graph paper. graph paper. Do you even know what that is, Charlie? Well, you know what graph paper is? So you can draw things really cool and it's got squares so you can connect them. Not real. I mean, I'm not really good at all that stuff in math. That's why I was a science teacher and now a counselor because... That's not, that's, not my th that's not my thing. Y'all have any of these? Yeah. Composition notebooks. They have spiral notebooks. Look, if you go to the store today, they, all kind, they have all kinds of different kinds of notebooks. You got journal notebooks. You got spiral notebooks. The one thing I did see that was back, all you that were trapper keepers. <laughs> Those are the greatest. I, I love a trapper keeper. Too bad sometimes the, the teachers, they'll be specific in their thing. Do not get a trapper keeper. I'm like, why not? It's the greatest tool ever. And then folders, of course. But then, you know, I got to thinking, am I really ready? I've got all my supplies. And I was reading through the scripture that Ryan put in there this morning. Did I have all, am I really ready? So there's some other things I put down in here that are things that God calls us to be. Even when we're in school, wherever we are. So you know what that word says? Humble. humble. What does humble mean? What does that mean? Nice, nice yeah. Usually people that are humble are usually nice. The humble means putting yourself behind others. That doesn't mean that you've got to, that doesn't mean God wants you to think that you're a terrible person. That's not what that means. You know, a lot of people think if I'm humble, I've got, I'm the worst person. And we are, we are weak. We have things that we're weak at. But humble is not putting yourself first, not being so self centered. Okay? That's what humble means. What's that word? Compassion. Do you know what that means? When you're compassionate about something, you really, you love it, right? You want to do it, right? We should have compassion on other people. Jesus calls us, God calls us to be compassionate to other people, no matter what they look like, no matter what they dress like, no matter if they're mean to us. Did y'all know that? Y'all ever had somebody be mean to you at school? It's really hard, right? But Jesus calls us to love our neighbors, right? And to love our enemies, even though those people... So we have to have compassion, and compassion is something Jesus showed every one of us, right? Of course, compassion leads to what's that? Love. love. We all know what that is, right? Y'all love. Y'all have people you love. You have your parents. You have. But there are there sometimes people in your class or maybe in your family that might be hard to love. Okay, maybe right. But if God calls us to love, just like He calls us to have compassion, He calls us to love one another and to love Him and to lo to love all people, no matter what. I didn't put a capital T on this one. I don't know what I was doing. What is that word? Tenderness, tenderness okay? Tenderness is kind of like kindness. Y'all ever heard? Y'all know what kindness is, right? In my room at, at school, one of, one of my signs that's in my classroom is about being kind. No, no act of kindness is ever too small. That's what it says, and it has kindness in big letters. Tenderness is kind of the same thing as being kind. So it all kind of falls into place, right? Attitude. Y'all have an attitude. <laughs> 
think we all do. Sometimes our attitude's really stinky. Sometimes our attitude's really good, right? Just depends on what mood you catch us in. But an attitude of Christ, when we go out to people, all of these words are guiding us to have an attitude of Christ. What would Christ do? What would, in this situation, how can I help this person no matter what? What is that attitude? What's our attitude going to be when we walk through those school doors, when we walk through the church door, or when we walk to, into our home? And to be, what's that word? A servant. One of the main things that Christ came and he said that he came to do was to be a what? A servant. I came to serve others, not to be served. And that's what he calls us to do. And all these words, these are words that when Ryan reads the scripture, he'll be, you're going to hear these words again, and it puts it all together in Philippians. But God, came, he came for us to do all these things. But above all, to be, what's that say? United with, united with Christ. And the way that we are united with Christ is by following him, believing in him, and knowing that he gave it all up for all of us. Every one of us, even those people that we love, even those people that are hard to love, he gave it all up for us. So just like we have to have our tools and our stuff for school, these are the most important tools that we are united with Christ and that we use those every day. Okay? So I'm going to pray, and then three and fours are going to go to Children's Church, but the rest of you were in service today. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for each and every one of these children. And Lord, as we're all gearing back up, especially for school, that that we have our tools, but we have our tools that you have given us as believers in Christ, that we show compassion, that we show love, that we're humble, that we are a servant to other people. Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Wonderful word, Miss Rhonda. We can remain seated, but I want to hear you singing, all right? It's uh, hymn number 297 if you need it. And then we're going to go into that wonderful chorus, Share His Love. So let's sing. I love to tell the story of Jesus and His love. Sing it. I love to tell the story That's beautiful. I love to tell the story for those who know this chorus share his love by telling what the Lord has done for you share his love by sharing of your faith and show the world that Jesus Christ is real to you
Let us pray. Lord, we come to you today with thankful hearts. Help us now at this time of offering to give back to you with joyful and open hearts. Help us to use these tithes and offerings in ways that would please you and lead us to go out into the world this week and be a light and share your love and grace to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This is Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. You know how depressed some of you are because your son talks lower than you do? <laughs> do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? And 
is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he loves? Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe. Every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom, a priest of God, to reign with his son. Is he worthy, is he worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy, is he worthy, is he worthy? Um, that has, I don't, I don't know a ton of new music, uh, but that has become, over the past few years, one of my absolute most favorite songs, and so, and they didn't know that, Pat and I didn't communicate about that before today, and so I'm just so thankful you sang that song, um, I can't wait till that day when we get to join in that chorus, amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, it is good to be here. And it is such a joy to be able to worship with you here in this place at this time uh, with you people. And before I begin, I just want to say a few words of thanks. I want to say thanks to everyone who has aided and assisted our family as we moved in, whether you helped unloading the truck, unpacking boxes, watching our boys. Many of you have brought food by, uh, whether a sack of tomatoes or a meal. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you to everyone who has uh, prayed for us as we uh, packed up our home in Nashville and relocated here to Jacksonville. I want to say thank you to everyone who has shared a word of encouragement to me uh, during and to our family during this time. Uh, frankly, it's a bit overwhelming, and I say that only in the most positive way. Um, so please, uh, when I say it's good to be here, know that it really is good to be here with you. I also want to say a word of thanks to the Pastoral Search Committee. 
uh, whom I know labored diligently for many months, not only in the last three months to bring me here, but they labored for many, many months prior to that. They talked to many, many people. And so I, w- I just want to say, as I got to know them, I knew that if they were representative of the congregation, that it was a congregation that I wanted to know. And so I want to just, uh, you don't need me to tell you, because you all witnessed even more than I did, how diligently they worked through this process, many hours in deliberation, many hours in discussion and in prayer. And so um, if you're a part of that committee and you're in the room, would you stand for just a moment? I know you've done this many times. You're going to have to do it at least one more time. And let us, uh, let's thank them with a round of applause. I look forward to ministering with you all uh, in the word of God and prayer and to celebrate with you in the joys that you and your family experience, to uh, be with you, minister to you, and walk with you through the sorrows that we all inevitably will face in our lives, and also to discern where the Holy Spirit would lead you, where he would lead us in ministering uh, to our neighbor, to love both our church here, to serve here in in, in the congregation, but also to love our community. Uh, And uh, I'm excited about this. I do want you to know one thing about me before I proclaim, before I open my Bible and proclaim the Word of God today. I just, I want to go ahead and get it out there. I am not perfect. (laughs) Many of you know that. You all come to learn that. It doesn't probably come as a shock. I'm going to make mistakes, and we all will. We all do. We're, we're, uh, We're fallen humans. Uh, But I endeavor to fall forward into Jesus' arms, and I hope that's your goal and desire is to do. Before I even uh, preach, I just want to give you a snapshot of of what I do. Uh, Many of you know um, I only work one day a week. um, (laughs) In all seriousness, um, uh, just some things that are going to be coming up in the next few uh, weeks, next few months. Um, Starting next Sunday, I'm going to be touring all the Sunday school classes just to visit with every class to get to know uh, the teachers to get to know the classes, and so uh, that'll, that'll take me some time. Uh, that'll take me at least a couple months, but uh, starting next Sunday, I'm going to be doing that. Um, also, I haven't set a date yet, but uh, hopefully by the middle of August, we'll resume the weekly senior adult Bible study that meets during the day. Maybe we'll just call that the daytime Bible study, uh, and uh, I will, again, I'll share more about that once I've had a little bit more time to plan and to prepare for that. Uh, and also, just over the next few weeks, uh, the next couple Sundays, I'm going to be just sharing with you some of what are my favorite passages of Scripture. I think they're paradigmatic for how I think of the Christian life, but really how I think the Bible and how Jesus would like us to live, both, again, both as individuals and as a congregation. So it's a bit sharing from my heart, but really, I really hope to share from the Scriptures what I think are some of the most important things. Uh, before, uh, later in the month, we'll start a new sermon series, Walking Through a Book of the Bible Together. Uh, But today I'm starting, I'm kind of starting at the top. This is my favorite passage in the entire Bible, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I shared it with the search committee in our first conversation, and I wanted to share it with you today because I think this is so foundational for how we conceive of ourselves as Christians. And so if you have your Bible today, I'd invite you to turn to the book of Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to be preaching on verses 1 through 11. Of course, you can open up a pew Bible, open up your phone. The text will be uh, back here on the wall as well. And again, I, I want to, uh, I learned this on Wednesday night. I'm going to orient you to something that I'm going to do regularly. Uh, every time I finish reading Scripture publicly, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord, and I would like us to all say, thanks be to God. Now, if you forget, I do have a slide queued up, so you should be able to see that on the, on the thing. But I really, I want us to recognize that not my own words, not the words that Pat or anyone else may share or that we may sing, that whenever we hear from the Bible, we are hearing from God's Word. God's Spirit is speaking to us in that moment. And so I really want us to just remember that together. So if you would, if you're able, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word today from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement from Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of one of the same mind, having the same love, being of in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than 
yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, would you speak to us now by your word? For we are listening, and we ask all of this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. One of the most essential tasks of the Christian life, and of anyone who claims to know Jesus, is that we should follow the words of Jesus. We have that phrase, what would Jesus do? And again, that... Saying it that way makes it sound easy, but we all know how challenging that can be at times, right? Even as simple as command as Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount, to bless your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you. There's something within us that resists that. It's hard to do that, to turn the other cheek. Again, that's a pretty straightforward thing that we shouldn't retaliate, but again, we, we want to. And there are certain Christian movements that are built around that one principle, but it's tough. It grates against our flesh. And, it, and it's hard enough to follow the things of Jesus that are clear. And also, it's hard to understand whenever we don't take Jesus' words literally. Now, I know you're probably thinking, like, the pastor's been here five minutes, and he's about to renege on the words of Jesus. I'm not about to do that. I'm not about to do that. We want to obey Jesus' words, but sometimes he was overstated. Right in Matthew 18, verses 8 through 9, Jesus says, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter into life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye than with two eyes and throw into the hell of fire. And the reason I say this is because to my knowledge, there's never been a sustained movement of Christians in history who has followed that literally, right? We don't read about that in the book of Acts. You know, they were, found themselves sinning, and so they removed a body part. That wasn't a part of the apostolic pattern that we received. But Jesus is using hyperbole, and, and we, we know that. We, we do that sometimes ourselves. But there's a command of Jesus that it kind of fits in the middle there, between the clear command of that he has given us, we know we need to do it, and the, but how do we do this in a real way? And it's that simple command that he issues, namely, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What could Jesus mean by this? He shared this with his disciples before his own crucifixion at a time. The crucifixion was something that you didn't talk about in polite company. It was shameful. It was grotesque. It was a form of execution that had been calculated to be a, a torture device for those who it was inflicted upon. So how are we to take up, our, take up our cross and to let alone do that daily? Because if you take up your cross one time in the ancient world, that's it. There's no extra time to do that. So what does Jesus mean? Right? To the uninitiated, to the person who may not be that familiar with the Bible, to take up your cross today in 2022 is something they probably would understand more to do at a Hobby Lobby than they would in the execution chamber. But I believe that Jesus' call for us is as valid today as it was 2,000 years ago. We need to grasp, though, I think, the jarring nature of what that one statement means for our Christian lives and for our own discipleship. Being a Christian isn't simply a matter of checking yes or no on a box, as you would maybe at the ballot box, right? You can just punch it and walk away. No, instead, we have to give our lives to it. It's not, it's not a lifestyle brand, right, where we all wear a certain style of clothing, we all listen to a certain style of music, watch the certain same type of movies, 
drive the same cars, paint our houses the same color. No, that's not what it means to be a Christian. Rather, being a Christian means that we follow Jesus. But we know him. That's the essence of the Christian faith, and it, it happens not just here in the four walls of the sanctuary, but even as we go to our places of work, to our homes, where we live. And so today, I want us to spend a, examining this segment from the letter of Paul to the church at Philippi. If you read in the book of Acts, in chapter 16, this is a church that he has an intimate connection with. He started the church in uh, Acts chapter 16 with a, a faithful woman and some outlaws, and it's a really momentous occasion. And he had an intimate relation with, relationship with this church. We read at the end of the book of Philippians, they supported him financially. As he went on from the city to other places, they supported him financially so that he could spend less time working in order to focus on proclamation and on equipping the church. He loves this church. He says in, in chapter 1, verse 9, he, his prayer for them is that their love would abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment so that they would approve of what is excellent and so be pure and blameless in the day of Jesus. And after extolling the virtues of being united to Christ, even in death, he says in chapter 1, verse 27, that they should only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And as we walk to chapter 2, it's kind of the climax of that exhortation. How does our manner of life be worthy of the gospel? Well, here's what I hope that you'll see in the passage today. This is my thesis statement for you, that living and loving the Jesus way means that we take up our cross and follow Jesus in order that the Holy Spirit might use our humiliation for others' exaltation as we anticipate the salvation coming at God's exaltation of his Son. Let me say that one more time, that living and loving the Jesus way means we take up our cross and follow Jesus in order that the Holy Spirit would use our humiliation for others' exaltation as we anticipate the salvation that comes at God's exaltation of his son. And the way I think we'll do it is we'll look at two requirements of the Jesus way. That's the phrase I'll use for the Christian life and also the result of that. The first is that the Jesus way requires unity. The Jesus way requires unity. Roll back the tape to chapter 1, verse 27, which I mentioned a moment ago. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, he says that I might hear of you that you are standing firm, listen to this, in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And then in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, that complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Did you hear all of the ones in there, all of the sames in there? Now, he's not aiming for a monolithic group of people who all look the same, but that we would all have the same spirit, unified around Jesus, arm in arm for the faith of the gospel. Right As the church, we need to remember that we're not simply a collection of individuals who decided to show up today, but we are a unified body. Some of you, I know it's the summer, and you've been to the beach recently, especially as you're looking at the calendar, and you know, you know school's about to start in a couple weeks. You're trying to get to the beach. And whenever you go out into the ocean, if you were to go, go out with your family, and each of you were to stand by yourself in the middle of the ocean water as the waves come in, if you stand by yourself, even if you're all in close proximity, you're going to get knocked down. But if you come together and you link arms, whenever that wave hits, you're going to be able to, you're at least going to have a better chance of withstanding the wave that hits you. But this shows us how important unity is in our lives, and it's essential for the Jesus way. But how do we achieve unity? How would Philippians 2 say we achieve unity? The first way is that we know God. Unity requires that we know God. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any comfort from love, any participation in the Holy Spirit. These are things that we can't just have with people who we enjoy the same football team with, who we have the same political preferences with, who we might live in the same neighborhood with. It's something that we have once we know God, right? If we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, and we've, again, if we've done that, the Bible says that we also are given the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. And so if we are in Jesus, the Bible uses the metaphor that we are his body and that he is our head. All of us, we make up different 
parts. We all have a different role to play in the body of Christ. But it's one body. It's not two bodies. It's not ten bodies. We are one body united under the head, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, the unity that we have is only a mirror. It's a reflection of the unity that the Father and the Son and the Spirit have together. It requires that we know God, and it also requires that we seek other people first, as Rhonda said a moment ago. All right, this is the aspect of the Jesus way that Paul is going to hit in this passage again and again and again. We must seek others first, and this is the ultimate key to the Christian life, that Jesus expounded, that Paul expounded, that Moses expounded, that the prophets expounded, namely, first, that we love God with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, but also the second commandment, which is like it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. The apostle Paul says in Galatians, if you fulfill this command, then you have fulfilled all the law and the prophets by loving your neighbor as yourself. And and we practice that love that we have for our neighbors out there, we practice that in here. We are each other's neighbors. It doesn't matter if you live next door to each other, if you live in the same town, if there is a human being, and especially if they proclaim Jesus as their Savior, you are neighbors. We can only achieve this type of unity if we are loving one another and seeking others' needs first. And this is why Paul says in verses three to four, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, that's the key word, in humility, Count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, I I want you to notice that Paul doesn't say, deny your interests. Imagine that you are a neutral party and that you have no care in the world at all. That's not what he says. But what he does say is, look at your interests and elevate other people. Right? You can still treat other people like garbage by loving them as yourself if you view yourself as garbage. That's not what Paul's calling them to do. Right, But I've heard it said about humility. Humility isn't thinking about yourself less, or sorry, it's not thinking less about yourself. Let me restart. Humility is not thinking less about yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. Right? It's not, I'll, 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 Rhonda had a great devotion earlier. I'll just adjust one thing she said. Humility is not putting yourself behind others. It's just putting others before yourself. You know, that's the big change. It's the key. That's the action that an outsider who doesn't know Jesus, who's not a part of the church, they'll see that and they will witness the love of Jesus. They'll recognize that it's a strange, alien love that this world doesn't know. And we have to put away any motive that we would have that would seek to give us glory and credit because we're constantly looking to the needs and the cares of others. This is uh, the, the reformer Martin Luther. This is one of his key insights that I think is amazing, which is that you know, we, we care as Baptists a lot about the priesthood of all believers. And it's because of this, we, as we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ, we don't have to worry about performing for Jesus. Now, we do want to live in holiness. He calls us to that. But I can be so busy about seeking the good of my neighbor because I don't have to worry about seeking my own need. I, I put other people first. And let me put a very specific application to this point, especially for us who are a part of the church. I think this is so critical for life in the church how, as we exhibit this. Not only should we have an attitude where this is the norm, where we're seeking other people's needs first, but it should be a place where people who don't do that should feel like there needs to be a change. Or the church should be the last place in the world where you would find a bully. And let me be clear, bullies, like everyone else, like all sinners, we're welcome at the foot of the cross. We're welcome to meet Jesus there to be called to repent and to turn, right? Come just as you are applies to everybody. But whenever you do come to Jesus, you're transformed, right? Whenever there's a bully in the church, it it kills the spiritual vitality of a place. Church bullies, they know how to work the system. They know how to jockey votes to their end or maybe who to talk to to set certain people over and against other people. And that cannot be how we operate as the body of Jesus Christ. That is a action that the Bible would describe not only as harmful, but as wicked. To use an adjective that the New Testament applies very rarely, but it's important, that is an action that would be considered anti-Christ because it would be dividing the body. How do you know if there's a church bully? I've been at churches where everyone in the room holds their breath to see if the bull's going to come out in the middle of the china shop. 
They're jockeying for their own preference. And, and the thing is, they know how to make it look like they're caring for others. They may do a lot outside to show up whenever you have a need, but it's all calculated to do certain things. It's the attitude, the habits of a narcissist. And brothers and sisters, hear my plea. This cannot define who we are as the body of Christ. Right? It should be a place where the very idea of a bully should be foreign. And if a bully shows up, then they're dealt with in a loving way, but a firm way. Because we have to seek others' needs first, just like Jesus did. Jesus was not a bully. Read the Gospels. The Pharisees show up, and they're bullies. They're counting everyone's sin immediately in the thing. They're not giving any, any inch of grace or mercy. But what does Jesus do? He receives the sinner. And it's interesting because he receives both the lowly and he receives the haughty whenever the haughty realize the depth of their sin and their own need of forgiveness. Because the Jesus way, listen, it requires unity. It requires unity. It requires putting other people first. And the second key ingredient, which is the second requirement of the Jesus way, is humility. Now, if only Paul could think of a good sermon illustration to fit that point. If only he could think of an example of someone who had a lot of high status but gave that status up to help those who were beneath him. If only he could think of someone who gave and gave to their own hurt. Brothers and sisters, verse 5 opens with these words. Have this mind among yourselves. What is that mind? It's the mind. That'd be of the same mind. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Seeking other people first. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality as a thing to be grasped. Other translations say a, a quality of, uh, to be taken advantage of, to be exploited for his own gain, but rather he made himself nothing. Taking the form of a servant, being, taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of man, in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death upon a cross. We can't simply say, well, but that's too radical of a claim. That's either something that is only for super Christians who are, you know, so close to Jesus, or well, because I'm a super Christian and I've attained my status, I don't have to do it. No, no, no. This is something for everyone. This, brothers and sisters, is how we take up our cross daily and follow Jesus. It's by following Jesus where he went. He went from the very top enjoying life and fellowship with God in eternity past, the creator of the universe who should receive all glory, and he took on the form of a servant. He became a human being, and he submitted himself to death, and not only death, but the most humiliating of deaths upon a cross. I want you to think about, just for a moment, of your resume, or, or, or maybe your, your college application, depending on what stage of life that you're in. What do you do whenever you're filling out your resume? You put your accomplishments, right? We, we want to have that story. You know, she started off as a, as a bagger at the grocery store. Then she became a cashier, and then the head cashier. And then she managed the customer service for the store. Then she became the store manager, then the regional manager, and now she's the COO of the company. We want this narrative of upward mobility, right? We climb in our status. We get better. We do more. We have more prestige. And maybe some of you aren't applying for jobs yet. You're at a stage of life where you've slowed down. I want you to think about your obituary for a moment. Seriously, what do you want to say? You want to say well, he was born into such and such a family. He did such and such a thing. He was an honorable person. He has three children, six grandchildren, nine great-grandchildren. We're going to list all of our accomplishments. And in, in ancient Philippi, the city where Paul wrote this letter, it was a very status-conscious city. It was a new city. People came there to make a name for themselves. There were a lot of retired military veterans there from the Roman military. And people would publicly go around saying their position. They would say he was born into this family of this tribe. And, and he had these certain accomplishments in different spheres of life. Just like we would on a resume. But what does Jesus' resume look like? Is it that narrative of upward mobility? Which again, it's, it's not bad to want to better yourself or yourself and your family. But what does Jesus do? He was in the form of God. And he humbled himself, taking the form of a slave by being, becoming like a human. And being, bound in human, being founding himself in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death upon a cross. He inverts our narrative of what we consider success by putting himself at the bottom 
and seeking our needs before his own. Now, that would seem foolish to people. It still seems foolish today. In Roman, what does 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 say? It says, God chose what was foolish in the world to shame the wise. He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring forth the things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. Whenever we sing that hymn, take up thy cross and follow me, I heard the master say, I gave my life to ransom thee, surrender your all today. We can't do so, we, we, or we can do that. We can take up our cross and follow Jesus because he went there first. It doesn't matter where the Lord is calling you, whether he's calling you to your next door neighbor or your neighborhood, or whether he's calling you to another country halfway around the world. It doesn't matter where you are location-wise. The method, the, the path is the same for all of us, that we follow Jesus, taking up our cross and following him. The cross where the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus so that whoever believes in Jesus Christ would not perish but have eternal life. This is the good news of the gospel. This is our salvation where Jesus died on behalf of the ungodly. And indeed, the free offer of the gospel stands even for us today, that if we believe in Jesus Christ, if we confess our sins and believe that he is our Lord and Savior, that we too will be saved. This is our salvation. And we remember the Jesus way it requires unity. It requires humility. But let's talk about the result. Because that still can be a tough order at times. But let us consider the result, namely that the Jesus way results in exaltation. The Jesus way results in exaltation. Even though Jesus gave it all up, look at verses 9 through 11. He, he went from the top to the bottom, and therefore, because he did all of those things, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The end of Jesus' humiliation was his glorification, his exaltation, and now all creation will worship the crucified king. Right? Remember, the cross, the cross is a grotesque place of, of death, of blood, of evil. And it's there, whenever Jesus hangs upon the cross, that we see his glory. What, is the, what does the centurion say at the foot of the cross? Surely this man was the son of God. It's here that the father receives the death of the son. And, and we see in Roman, Revelation 5, we sang that song earlier. I told you I like that song a whole lot. And one of the things that the people sing, that the tribes and the nations and the elders and the living creatures sing before God in heaven, whenever the lamb shows up, the lamb, as if it had been slain, but it was still yet alive, they sing this in Revelation chapter 5. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal. Why? For you were slaughtered. And by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign in the earth. Brothers and sisters, this is why we gather. It's the very purpose of our creation. It's the very purpose of our redemption. It's the goal to which our, our lives are aimed, is to be here with the Lamb and to worship Him and exalt Him there. You say, well, Jesus was exalted, but what about us? And I do think we need to remember that the preeminent person here in Philippians 2 is the Son, is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is exalted by the Father. But remember what Jesus promised, that whoever humbles himself, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted, right? The, the last shall become first, and the first shall be Last, if we follow Jesus to the cross, we can trust, we put our trust and our assurance in him that he will make all things right on that day. As Christians, we don't have to claim for our rights. We don't have to jockey for our position. We don't have to pursue prestige. We don't have to tout our accomplishments. Rather, we can pursue the cross where all might believe and be saved as we live and we proclaim and we love the Jesus way. Living and loving the Jesus way is, is not always easy, but also once you've done it for a while, it gets to be tough. Loving the Jesus way can mean both loving like Jesus loved, but it also means that we love the way that Jesus goes, and we come to find it normal. 
It's discipleship from top to bottom, namely a discipleship which begins at the top and ends at the bottom because there God will exalt us. And again, the, the free offer of the gospel is that whoever follows Jesus there, if you trust him by faith, a faith that has legs, a faith that follows Jesus to the cross, that there we will receive salvation. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to be standing down front in, in just a minute. And uh, if anyone would like to talk about what it means to become a Christian, to give your life to the Lord, I would love to talk to you. It's also a time where uh, maybe you're interested in, in joining and becoming a part of this church family to pursue the Jesus way with us here. Also, I'd love to talk to you uh, down front about how you can become a member of this body. So if you would, please bow your head with me and let us go to the Lord now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and uh, we're thankful, Father. We're thankful that Jesus, your son, our brother, has gone before us. Father, if we had tried to pursue that way without his example, without his triumph and victory, Father, we would only, res we would only end up at the bottom. It would have accomplished very little. But Father, because your son, Jesus Christ, who became a human being for us, he lived a perfect life. He died upon the cross, not only to give us an example, but also so that we might be forgiven. And he rose up from the dead in order that we too might raise from death to life. Father, we come to you now and uh, we, we just are so thankful. Would you help us, Father? We can't do this in our own strength. And indeed, our, our, our flesh will rebel against this way of thinking. The world will look at it and think it's crazy. But nevertheless, it's where Jesus has gone before us. It is the Jesus way. And so would you strengthen us by your Holy Spirit today to do this every day? God, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Hymn 332. Without Him I could nothing without him I'd surely fail without him I would be drifting like a ship without a may be seated. I want to, again, just thank everyone for uh, being here today, and I, I really do hope, it, hope I get the chance sometime soon to meet you. There's many of you here, and 
I'm excited to see you today. I, I, I will kind of make the promise that I probably will forget your name at least three times. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of names to learn, uh, but I'm excited to be here today. We have some exciting things to do at the end of the church today. I'd invite Allie and Cindy to come on and stand forward. Uh, the faces may look familiar to you. We have Allie Smith. Is that right? Okay. Again, names. And Cindy Fair. Cindy Fair. Uh, they have both come today to join the church with promise of letter. And so if you would receive them into the membership here, would you say amen? Amen. 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 All right, we're excited. If you all will take a seat uh, just now. At, at the end of the service, they'll be standing up here for you to come, uh, shake their hand, hug their neck, all the, all the things that we've been doing. Uh, I want to remind you of just a couple things. Uh, first off, uh, Nikki's not here, so let me say this on her behalf. Uh, if you are hoping to volunteer for VBS, please get in touch with her. Let her know. Uh, it's better for her to make a plan on the front end. Uh, I say this as the son of a, of a former children's minister. I've seen it on the other side. Uh, if you know you're going to help, uh, let her know on the front end so she, she can make a plan for you. Again, we'll have that meeting after church next Sunday. Um, also, at the conclusion of our service today, we're going to have the brick ceremony for Joe Williams in the courtyard. So in addition to uh, welcoming Cindy and Allie into the congregation, also know that we'll be moving out there to have that a ceremony. It won't be very long, but we do want to um, do that in honor of Joe Williams. And I think that's all. This is my first time doing this. So uh, <laughs> I think that's all that I have. So um, uh, if you would, just uh, once again, bow your head with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit whom you send to us. Father, would you be with us this week as we go forth from this place uh, to our places of work, to our homes? Uh, Father, would you help us to be a blessing to our neighbor? Uh, Father, help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus as we take up our cross. Help us to uh, not be worried about what our status might be in the eyes of the world because we are following Jesus Christ. Uh, God, I thank you for uh, these sisters who have come here to be a part of this fellowship. I pray that as we receive them, uh, that they would uh, find a place where they can serve as members here and that we can be a blessing to them as we journey on the, in our faith together. Uh, Father, would you be with us this week? We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.